I didn't realize it, but that was going to be my direct job for NASA, to return him safely to Earth. Now, it's great to go to the moon, but it isn't better to get back. And so that was my job, to be the mission alarm system engineer so that anything went wrong, I'd come up with a way of being able to escape any kind of a problem. And so that was my duty. I did it for seven years working on the Apollo program. And so we had problems. Maybe we could dim the lights a little bit. Yeah, could we? Is there a way to do yes. that? Uh, yes. You know, especially if we're going to do any kind of video. I don't know how to do that thing. Okay. 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 That's all right, I guess. Okay. And uh, here's the deal. The Soviets set something up called the Sputnik. And it was the first craft to actually orbit Earth. And there is something called the Space Race that you all well know about. And the Soviets... You know, they were ahead of us because they had sent out, you know, the dog, little star, and other things before we could get our chimpanzees up into space. And uh, we were having flop nicks. Here's some of our flop nicks. Here's a flop nick right here. Vanguard rock. Pop, pop. That's going the wrong way. It should go up. It went down. Horrible. Okay, so, and here's another try. try. Here we go. Up, up, and away. Course of dynamics. Yeah. Here. Now here's another one. Now this is the best. Stage one, stage two, stage three. A great example of staging. Only thing is not supposed to be in a thousand feet. You know? <laughs> so we had flocknicks and the Soviets had Sputnik and uh, let me Okay, here's the lines. I'm gonna do this. This is my first song. I play songs and uh, this is my first one. And uh, it has to do with the launch of this guy. And let's see if we can make the thing play. Uh, obviously, the song is based on an Elvis song. Let me see if I can get this thing to play. <coughs> Let me see if it'll play. <laughs> there we go. Oh. That's the launch escape system. That's supposed to save the astronaut's life. It launched with the actual it didn't. And, and wait a minute, wait. Now that's the recovery raft that was supposed to keep him from drowning in the Atlantic Ocean. What a start! Now can you imagine Ellen Shepard, who's going to actually ride that thing, watching that particular video? It would, you know, give you pause, wouldn't it? And so I thought, well, that's the great, you know, return to sender. The astronauts want to be returned by the ones who sent them. Now, here again, I'm a, I'm a product of the 50s, you know, rock and roll. And that was the era when the actual space program for us started. And the original seven astronauts, Carpenter, Cooper, Glenn, Grissom, Shara, Shepard, Slayton, were all selected, the Mercury astronaut. And they all wanted to be returned to the people that sent them. And so here's my song. Climb into the capsule, waiting to lift off. In the next few seconds, was too scared to cough. Return to sender, face the unknown, but please don't call us. There's no phone. NASA said, don't worry about nothing at all. The state of Florida will surely break your fall. Return to orbit, face the unknown, please don't cost, there's no fault. When I heard that booster blast, I knew soon I'd be rocking litter. They said, what do you expect? It was built by the lowest bidder. Return to orbit, face the unknown, please don't cost, there's no phone. Okay, that's my first number, guys. <laughs> and here's John Glenn. Now, John, uh, on February 20th of 1962, actually orbited Earth. Uh, I'm giving you a little history lesson here. Shepard didn't orbit. He just launched over the Atlantic, 15-minute flight. Uh, he was uh, May 5th of 1961. This is about a year later, 62. And so 
In order to remember... Copy me, John Glenn. Another song. Yeah. Nine, eight, seven. Now watch the video, and it tells you all about the mission. Deep down in Florida, north of Everglades, Johnny Glenn sat in his capsule, history bound to be made. Thousands of people came from miles around to watch Johnny Lodge hear his rocket sound. He was in a celestial race, trying to catch those Soviets in space. Go, 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 Johnny, go, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, Godspeed, Johnny H. into the sky, afraid Johnny was not afraid to die. Next said his heat shield might fail, he'd come back to earth in a blazing trail. His wife and children he not see again, afraid Johnny would have a fiery end. Go, go, go Johnny, go, go, go. In the Korean War, flying saber jets for America's Marine Corps, but no fire in heaven or earth or space could keep Johnny Glenn from his rightful place. Tales will be told for decades to come of Johnny H. Glenn Pace, their band one. Go, go! Original, but the tune you may recognize by a guy named was it Chuck Berry? You know, remember the Chuck Berry Duck Walk? Did you ever see that? <laughs> Are you folks my vintage? You remember Chuck Berry Duck Walk? And it, there was a song called Johnny B. Good. Remember it? Okay, so I adapted it to John Glenn. To go to red. And I sent the lyrics to that to John Glenn. He passed on about two years ago. He was, I think, the oldest living of the Mercury when into the 90s. And he actually autographed my lyrics, and so I hung it in my office, you know. That's an honor that he actually read it and liked it, and autographed the lyrics and sent it back to me. Okay, so here's my story. Uh, that's what I looked like at, at about uh, 19 years old. Uh, the way I got to work on the space program was, I'm from Indiana. Indiana loves the game of basketball, and I wanted to be a great basketball player, and so, I would practice every night, practice, practice, practice. From fifth grade to twelfth grade, I put in 8,000 hours practicing the game of basketball. I averaged 10 points a game as a senior in high school, not going to get a class through a scholarship. So went into the final game of the, the sectional, that's what they call it in the Indiana State Tournament. We were playing the number one team in Indiana. I had a miracle game. I scored 20 points against the best defensive a high school player ever in Indiana State history. He went on to college and held the leading score in the nation. In college, 11 points, I ate his lunch. I made 20 points against him. And so based on that one game, I got a full basketball scholarship to Rice. Yeah. However, wow. however, I had a very dismal basketball career at Rice. I had the lowest shooting percentage in Rice University history. <laughs> I have made only one shot in my varsity career. I tried 18 shots, I made only one. And the one was against Baylor University. I jumped up and saw our center under the basket. I threw him a pass, it went over my, I, I scored a bad pass. I'm really sure I can do. And academically, I was doing just as bad. I set a record here in differential equation. This is, five's not good. If you look here, it says five is failure, D is drop. I didn't drop. Bryce wouldn't let me drop. And so I made not only an F, but an F minus. 
I gave this talk at Rice University, by the way. They had uh, people that had worked on the space program. And believe it or not, I'm listed among the notable Rice alumni. <laughs> and they have listed all these Nobel Prize winners. And there I am. My, my, my. And then they, they listed all these Olympians, Rice Olympians. And there I am with my one out of 18, you know? And the reason I'm listed is because of the talks I'm giving to you guys are motivational, hopefully, as well as what I did on the alarm system for Apollo. And so here's, here's a, the Beatles were great in that era. Now I've got, I have hats, but if I put these hats on, it messes up my hair. And uh, so for the pictures later on, I won't look good. <laughs> but uh, this, the Beatles were great. And this is a good song for me. He's a real nowhere man. Remember that one? <laughs> With his nowhere plans for nobody. Because it's been a hard day's night. His crazy like a jump scar dog. Hard day's night. He feels like a barnyard hog. Then, help! Help! Somebody please help me! These are all Beatles songs. When I was younger, so much younger than today Never needed my body's help in any way Now I am older, much less self-assured Won't somebody please open up a door? Help! Somebody please help me!
that that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are willing to postpone, and one we intend to win. Okay, did you hear? We don't do this thing because it's easy. We do it to challenge. The hardness of it is worthwhile. That's going to bring out the best in us. And so when I heard those words, that got inside me. Getting a degree at Rice University was not easy. It was hard. And so his words actually motivated me to try to graduate. And so there's a guy named, uh, what is it, Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie. And he had a song, and I've adapted it, of course. Well, it's hard, ain't it hard, ain't it hard? Learning something new to you. Yeah, it was hard. Hard, ain't it hard, ain't it hard? Great God! Learning something you never knew. Well, failure's not an option, they say. Ah, but they never had that test I took today. Houston got a problem, I cried. Ah, but I knew I couldn't pass if I tried. Because it's hard, ain't it hard, ain't it hard? Learning something new to you. Hard, ain't it hard, ain't it hard? Great God! Learning something you never knew. That's one of my better songs, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Woody. And so as we move along here, Oh, there he is. That's what he looks like, old Woody. Let's go to the next one. And NASA hired me, and that's what I, I was 22 years old. Can you imagine that? Imagine if the astronauts knew that I was just 22, and that was a sign of safety. Do you think that would have given them some degree of concern? And so, it, yeah, they were, because some of them actually came by my desk to meet me. And they said, how does this particular morning work? And so, yeah, I'd show them uh, what we had put in there to make sure they would get back to Earth. I even had the whole head of the whole Lunar Lander program team call me on the phone. He said, Jerry, how does this work? Well, he didn't see, he didn't know I was 22 years old, but I gave him a good answer, and he was satisfied. Okay, so that's what I was doing, as that guy right there. And they put me in a group called the Mission Evaluation Room, and I'm trying to explain to people, no one ever heard of the MER, the Mission Evaluation Room, nobody ever heard of it. See, it's not flight control, it's not an astronaut. It's a group of engineers that actually designed the lunar lander and the command ship. The, both vehicles were designed by the guys in my room. And so I was the designer of the alarm system. So that got me a chair in that room. So if there's ever kind of a problem, that was a really big problem. You know, it was one like, when the Apollo 13 exploded and they couldn't figure out how to clean carbon dioxide out of the air, guess who answered that? The guys in our room were the ones that solved the problem, which I'll show you how we solved it. So when there were really big problems, uh, George Lowe, the head of the whole spacecraft program, after the Apollo 1 fire, and those guys perished on the launch pad, he said, we need another group of engineers so that during an Apollo mission, if there's a very serious problem, we can go to these guys in the mission evaluation room, building 45, and they've designed it, they've tested it, they know exactly how everything works, and they're the final say in solving a problem. So I was one of those guys. So that's what I wanted you to take away from this today, okay? And so in, the, in that, the alarms would come on. Uh, because I was the alarm guy, uh, when you flip a switch, now what happens when it's a hot summer day and the air conditioner comes on, all the lights get dim and it drops the voltage in your whole house system down? Well, that would turn on an alarm in, in the, the spacecraft if something <coughs> similar happened. So I needed to eliminate all that kind of stuff so that the astronauts, when they're landing on the moon and some system comes on and the master alarm comes on and they don't make a mistake and, and Neil Armstrong jerk the hand controller and he misses tranquility base altogether. So it's a job that was important and I had to eliminate all these nuisance alarms. So that was one of the, here's an example. I wrote up this whole procedure when Neil Armstrong turned on the eagle to descend on the moon, he would read my words to see what lights should be on just because you just turned on the system. Like you get into your automobile, you turn it on and you maybe have a light on because the engine hadn't started up. He had to know what you could expect. And if it wasn't on my list, there was a problem. Okay, 
So here's some things that saved Apollo 11. Uh, one of the things that uh, the astronauts, when Neil Armstrong sat down, you know, in his, uh, he was on the left side. Here he had Armstrong, Collins, and over here was Oliver. You know, so Armstrong's going to be the first on the moon. One of the reasons they said that he got to go on first was the lunar lander has two people, and if you open the hatch to, to get into the lunar surface, Armstrong's over here so he can easily get out. Now, uh, Aldrin can't. He's not the commander. He's the lunar module pilot. So that's one of the reasons Neil Armstrong was first on the moon. But when they're going to launch at Cape Kennedy, here's a gentleman that actually saw Apollo 13 before it launched right here. You say you have a famous person in here besides <laughs> Okay, so, so they're about to launch. And you see that hand controller right there? And he's got this big pouch on the arms to put moon rocks in. And you know when you launch, you're, je you're just going up and down and up and down. And if that pouch right there hits the hand controller, you abort the whole mission. So guess what? When Neil launched, he got way over like this. You know, because he didn't want to jar and hit that hand controller because it would abort. So that saved Apollo 11, the fact that he sat in the right position, okay? Now, I like to show this. It's, it's really a tragic thing, but it's a, hey, has everybody seen the Apollo 13, the movie? Yeah. Okay, is, is, well, if you haven't seen it, okay, I recommend it. Uh, and I'll tell you more about it. But here's from the movie. Inspired by the late President Kennedy, in only seven years, America has risen to the challenge of what he called the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. After trailing the Russians for years with our manned space program, and after that sudden and horrible fire on the launch pad during a routine test, to kill American astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chapman. There were serious doubts that we could beat the Russians to them. Okay, I had gone to the manufacturer of that ship, the spacecraft trail was called, and I had worked with Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee to make sure the alarm system would help them out. And Roger and I conferred and we made some changes on that. And uh, this, this particular clip bothers me. If you notice, when they go up to flick that switch, what happens? It bursts up in the front. That's the way Hollywood has the fire starting that was very tragic. Let me tell you, that is not true. When I was first assigned my first project at NASA, they gave me switches and gauges and wires and panels. And I was distraught. I said, I'm an electrical engineer. They said, OK, you can have the alarm system, which is electrical. But I had that switch. And that switch had to be tested. It was flipped 50,000 times. And I signed a test report that said it was a reliable ship, a sw switch and it would never fail. But Hollywood has made me the direct cause of the Apollo 1 fire. It didn't happen that way. Always remember that. I didn't cause the fire. That was Hollywood's, you know, how they wanted to do it in the video. But let me tell you this. The fire was not in vain because because of that fire, we did all kinds of changes to the Apollo spacecraft. We made sure that electrical shirts would never cause a problem like that again. We did all kinds of things. It's a whole story in itself. But that saved Apollo 11, 12, 13, everything because of all the design changes. And those guys didn't die in vain because of their lives. They gave their lives, but it saved other astronauts. OK, so here we are. Okay, so we're going to land at Trancote Base. Neil Armstrong uh, sees a uh, rough terrain there, and he has to actually do a manual landing. Well, before that, my master alarm starts coming on, and I'm thinking, oh my, I'm going to go down in rice engineering infamy. I'm going to keep Neil Armstrong off the moon because I hadn't foreseen that particular nuisance alarm. The thing came on five times. And so, so every time it came on again, oh no, there's another nail in my coffin as, a, as an electrical engineer, you know. I hadn't foreseen that, you know. And it was a nuisance alarm. And uh, 
I had seen a lot of other nuisance of ours, but just two weeks, just two weeks before they were going to the moon, they had a simulation. And the flight controllers actually hadn't noticed it before, two weeks before either. And just because they had a simulation, I had a friend named Steve Bales. He and I were members of a Christian businessmen's group, and we would have breakfast, and he told me this story. She said, Jerry, just two weeks before the launch, we went over that program a lot. Had we not gone over it, we probably would have aborted the whole Apollo mission. But because we've been through it, it turns out that they did land. Now, because this is the 50th anniversary, I can tell my own story. Okay, here's my story. Yeah, it's true that the program alarm was something I didn't see, but I saw something else. I was having lunch at the Grumman plant, the makers of the Eagle, and I was having lunch there. It cost Grumman four dollars for my lunch. And I said, Jim, Jim, you know there's a nuisance alarm that could come on. The landing radar, when you're coming down to the lunar surface, the landing radar has to tell Neil Armstrong how high they are above the surface. And if the landing radar gets too hot or too cold, it's going to ring them NASA alarm because maybe it's not giving the right data. But Jim, I said, Jim, what if they get on the lunar surface and the temperature of the lunar surface is so cold that it actually turns on the master alarm. And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin would be getting onto the moon, and the temperature is getting lower and lower, and Neil's about to pick up a moon rock, and all of a sudden, my alarm comes on in the new eagle. They have to quit. They can't pick up moon rocks. They, they, they can't even do the, 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 the moon rock. They can't even talk to President Nixon. <laughs> They're going to have to get right back into the lunar lander and see what was the cause of the alarm. I said, Jim, we need to fix that. So I drafted an engineering order that they remove that director thing because it wasn't going to really cause a problem landing yard. So here's the thing. Yeah, I didn't save the lunar landing, but you just saw the man that saved Neil Armstrong's moon. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's more important, saving the landing or saving the wall? Okay. Okay. And there's my buddy Steve. Steve was the one that made the call, and over here is Jack Garvin. They collaborated together in flight control to save it. Okay. And Neil Armstrong, here's the guy that saved it. Neil was training over Ellington Field, and they had this awful looking spider kind of a thing. And watch it. There he goes. The thing was going to crash. And the idea of that thing was gonna, you're going to use it like you're actually landing on the moon. And he should have died. You see that? Over here, he was coming right towards the fire. Yeah. And this is, I, 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 I speak to a lot of Christian groups, and I, like, I have another program, uh, and I share the, all the things that God did, because it was on a Sunday, by the way, that we landed, so a lot of people were praying, churches all over. And so this is one of the answers to prayer that saved Neil before that time, because he was going to burn up in a fire, and out of nowhere, Suddenly a wind came and just blew it strongly past it and saved his life. Now, who was the author of that wind? Only one person that I know can change the wind, okay? And here's another thing. The descent quantity life. They make big thing about this. 40th anniversary. There was only 30 seconds of fuel left. Only th I said, no. I set that particular light when it should come on. And when that light came on, you had more than a minute. You could hover there over Tranquility Base for another minute. But it sounds better if you said, only 30 seconds, you know, it's so much more drama that you quickly have to make a decision. So that's another thing I like to clear up, okay? Okay. And all these things, you think, look, Jerry, he could be making these things that happened 50 years ago. He could come over here and tell us all kinds of fishermen stories. And we couldn't even refute it. You see this thing is called the Apollo Experience Report. This is the eagle, the lunar night eagle. Now, if you notice the two guys there, the part that's on the warning system, that's me. I wrote the whole thing. This particular thing that I put is two-thirds of the whole document because it deals with all those nuisance alarms that we had to fix. So if you want to verify it, just Google my name uh, and, you know, spell it right here. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll, you can go to that link and read every one of these things I'm telling you about. Okay, so where are we at now? Okay, if we Okay, I won't go into this, but we had a meeting. Had a, 
Everything you did, you had to take before the, this board of managers, you know, Gene, uh, not Gene Kranz, but uh, uh, Christopher Kraft, that named the Mission Control Center after him. George Lowell was the man ahead of the board, and all of us had to defend what we'd done. So I did, I, I traveled back and forth to Grumman, back and forth to Grumman, and then out to the manufacturer of the command ship, and go over all these alarms and everything, and finally got it all together. So we're at a board meeting, I, we were presenting it, and some guy in the back of the room after we finished said, oh, this concerns me. And so he says, I think we ought to look at this again. And so George Lowe, he's about to say, yeah, let's just revisit it. And something happened to me. I mean, I just did this one time in my career. That's probably why I never have been promoted since that day. But, so I'm sitting over here, and this guy in the back of the room says, I won't say what his name is. Anyway, he said, uh, we need to revisit that. So I heard that, and Lowe was about to say, I jumped up. I said, Mr. Lowe, if you understood how much work went into this and the degree of care we took on this whole investigation, you would certainly not want to redo the whole thing. I said, bye. I walked out of the room quickly. And uh, some of my friends and astronauts support said, Lowe said, who was that guy? And uh, they said, well, he does a good job. And he's worked real hard on that. And you would be well to take into account what he said. So they never had to do the whole thing again. And that's why we saved the moon rock. Okay, so that was one of the things in there. Okay. And, uh, okay, this is the song. And, uh, yeah, we'll, let me go into this real quick. Uh, the reason I'm doing this thing is, you know, we're having the 50th anniversary over here at Space Center Houston. And uh, I could... They, they, somebody called me. I got it by mistake. They were asking for astronauts who would speak about the 50th anniversary. And I don't know how I got on this list, so I got on it. And I said, hey, I'm not an astronaut. I said, one thing I do do, I play the guitar. And I've got something called the Apollo Rock and Roll Show. And so, so the lady that had you know, put out this thing for a call for astronauts said, hey, that sounds kind of interesting. You know, that might be good for the 50th anniversary to do your rock and roll show. And so I've got all these things, and I, uh, there's this one song. It was a song by a guy named Johnny Horton, and it really was about uh, Jackson, President Jackson, the Battle of New Orleans. And I've got it in my rock and roll show. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. 1969 took a little trip, our first set five and our Apollo ship. Took a lot of food and a lot of water too, cause going to the moon was something we had to do. Hired our engines and our moon kept it coming, wasn't as far as it was a while ago. Hired once more, our ship kept a humming, down to the moon with the craters below. Houston said we want no surprise, so we opened up the front and opened our eyes. Eagle ships too high, the alarm began to ring. Looked out the window and didn't say a thing. We fired our rocket and the moon kept the coming. It wasn't as far as it was a while ago. Fired once more, our ship kept the humming. Down to the moon with the crater below. I forget the other two verses, so I'll move on. <laughs> Okay, if you all stand, the program is moving. If you'll stand, I'm going to give you something, okay? Would you stand? Everybody, it's good to you know, kind of relax a little bit. And this is a really, it's not to be the hand of God's providence, because ever since it happened, about two, three years later, I, I kind of, what they call it, me, but I, I finally found a personal relationship with the Lord. And so I started going out and giving these things. And this is what's so unbelievable. They have a place called Rothko Chapel. Have you ever heard of it? It's in Houston. So they had what they call uh, evidence of the divine, they call it. Concepts of the divine. So they had a Hindu uh, believer come and give his concept of the divine. Then they have a Muslim come. And they said, we haven't had a Christian guy come yet. And so they contacted NASA, the, the Speakers Bureau. And they said, do you have somebody who could give, you know, works for NASA, his view, his Christian perspective of the divine? And so the speaker chairman, you know, I know her real well, Linda Johnson, Dr. Johnson, she said, well, I got one guy I know will do that. So they, NASA sends me over to Rothko Chapel, 
and, and to give this talk about things that rescue the Apollo 13. And I'm going to give the things that I saw correlation between prayer and actual things that happen. So I gave this full talk. And I couldn't believe it. They, the Houston Chronicle sent out a reporter and a cameraman. And they actually, you know, took pictures of me and everything. And the belief section that Sunday had a big picture of me talking about how God, you know, helped rescue Apollo 13. I could have never done that. That had to be the, the Lord's word, you know. I've been praying for something like that to happen for 40 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's one of the things that happened. Let's get that hand on the lid line to hit my knee. Yep. I was really torn. It was all smooth. Oh. Okay, that was one of the first things. There was a, a uh, Christian friend of mine, a uh, Baptist guy up in Friendswood area, Merlin Merritt, his name was, and he told me, he says, it was a real problem because they weren't actually powering down the command ship, and there were these batteries, and they were having to keep the ship alive with these batteries. And if they use them too much longer, it's doubtful that there'll be enough juice in them to actually rear Earth's atmosphere. So when they when they went to close that hatch, now that hatch was not designed by you know theoreticians at Rice University. The real engineers put it together, A and M in Texas. You see. <laughs> so uh, at Rice, you're supposed to get your PhD. And I had enough at Rice, you know, so I didn't go on. <laughs> and so anyway, that hatch had been tested thousands of times and never failed to see. But that one time, that one time when they didn't want it to see, because they're going to have to go through it to get into the lunar lander, the rescue ship, it would not work. Now, later on the mission, if they couldn't have made it work then, they'd have died. It worked perfectly. Now, that's my point, you know. Somebody was helping us, okay? And here's, that was one of the things. That, uh, the sit, okay. Can you listen to some queries, go ahead. That's my alarm right there. Uh, yeah, just, we were just looking at that. Uh, CO2 measurement has jumped four notches in the last hour. I can't be right. I would open those numbers three times. Yeah, that sounds about right. We were expecting that. Well, that's very comforting to know, Houston. Uh, what do we do about it? Yeah, we're working on taking it down here for you. Do you copy? I would figure it for two people. Here's the problem. The ship that exploded uses square filters to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 24 of these. Plenty to get back to Earth. The ship that's going down the lunar surface, this is a oil filter I got at the part of the store. It's round. Now, how do you make these square filters work in the round barrel in the rescue ship? Pretty tough. Bryce never taught me how to put a square peg in a round hole. And so. <laughs> This is, here again, I went to a, I gave a talk on uh, a Christian group, and a lady came up to me <laughs> after I'd given my message about the Lord and everything. She said, Mr. Whitfield, the night that they were facing that, I had what she called a vision. I guess it was a thought in her mind. I could see these farmers, and they were in a farm barnyard, and they, were, they had pigs, and they had this barrel, and they couldn't get these pigs to fit in the barrel. And so... What they were doing, they were paddling the pigs to force them into the barrel. And I just prayed whatever that meant, that somehow they fit in the barrel. Well, I said, ma'am, what you just gave me was an analogy of we couldn't get those square pegs to fit in the round barrel for the astronauts' lives to be saved. And so here's how we did it. The guy, the name is Bob Smiley, he came, came in and he says, hey, I, I think I know how we can save their lives. You know, uh, I know that on board they have these moon, moon rock bags and suit bags, and if we can take those square filters and put them at the mouth of the bag, like that, and then I know on board they have this fan that blows, it actually moves the atmosphere around the cabin, and we have hoses that go to the suits. I got this at Toys R Us before they went out of business. Okay. So if we can take the fan and it's sucking the air through that bag like a vacuum cleaner, and uh, it, you know we could just save their lives. The only problem is, guess what? It's going to leak. 
you know, it's going to leak. So Bob, Bob said, well, I think, I think what we can do is what will save their lives is this stuff. You see this stuff? Duct tape. So they taped up the opening in that bag, and because they had duct tape on board, the astronaut's lives were safe. So don't ever be without duct tape. Something <laughs> in your automobile, your purse, put it around your waist or something, but always have some duct tape around it. And of course, the, with me, here's how the movie depicted it. And uh, I think we, if you've seen the movie, it just isn't the continued center of the mold they looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. <laughs>
showed me this. He said, Jerry, I came up with an idea before Apollo 13, actually before Apollo 8. That was one when they read from the Bible on Christmas Eve. I came up with this idea. If you can't see stars, you could actually sight your sextant on the sun or the moon or the earth, three points in space, and you could save their lives that way. And that's exactly what they did because after Apollo 8, after they read from scripture on the moon, Jim Lovell took a sighting with his sextant and went to enter the numbers in the computer and he hit erase instead of enter. And that erased everything. And so Mission Control's navigator said, hey, we've got this other procedure. And it uses the sun and the earth and all that. Try it out, Jim. Well, Jim was the navigator in Apollo 8, just read the word of God. And so Jim tries it out. And guess who's going to have to use it on Apollo 13 to save the lives of the crew? The commander is Jim Lovell, the same guy that already had tried it out on 8. And in Apollo 13, because we had it, they could navigate back to Earth and steer it. Okay, so I close with this. I got a letter uh, from a school teacher in Pennsylvania. She said, Mr. Woodfield, I put this story out in a Christian magazine called Voice, and she had read it, and she said, Mr. Woodfield, I read your story, and I wanted to share this with you. I was teaching a class of 14 students. These kids, none of them are over age 13. And on the morning of the day that Apollo 13, on April 17th of 1970, uh, my little red-haired student, Rwanda, came running into the room and said, Teacher! I heard before school that our astronauts are going to land in a terrible storm, and they may not live. What are we going to do, teacher? And so all the class was looking at that teacher, and she said, kids, I don't know what to do except to pray for the astronauts. So let's just pray, because there's somebody that can move storms. He did it on a sea called Galilee, and let's just pray. And then all those 14 kids began to bow their heads and pray for our astronauts. And guess what? Those kids were a special education class. Not one of those children had an IQ above 80. But they knew what it was to love people and to pray for them, and they prayed. And guess what? Their prayer was answered because when that, there they are, praying. And here's the final scene for us to see. They came down to the best landing we had in the entire Apollo program. The storm moved away unexpectedly. The weathermen were wrong. They had not considered their one in the class break. And the storm moved away, and we had our best landing in the entire Apollo program. And so here's what we want to close with. And I'm going to make sure this goes. Where's that laptop? I need to have. Can you go? There, there they are. Okay, we're fine. Respect. Go find. Excellent. Go. Diligence. Go find. Perseverance. Go. Wisdom. Go find. Honor. Go. Leadership. Go.